to our uh, new series on the Second Vatican Council, and Don is going to explain a little more about the technicality of uh, those councils. But uh, the church has convened, um, on average, once a century, a, uh, a big meeting of all the bishops uh, or the available bishops to come to one place and deciding um, theological, uh, practical, um, uh, liturgical questions of, of the entire church. So the reason that we are personally invested in this is first that Don here, uh, as humble as he looks, he was ordained a priest uh, in Rome during Second Vatican Council. So when he was a, a seminarian in Rome, the, the, the council has been going on. He overlapped for two years. So that is really uh, an incredible testimony. And then further than that, what we do today in the Jewish Christian uh, conversations and teachings and uh, friendship would not have been able to exist without the Second Vatican Council. The Second Vatican Council changed the paradigm of how the church treated many other faiths, but specifically the Jewish faith that is seen as the uh, as a sibling or a, a, an elder in the, in the faith. So I'm invested in it personally because I realized that I wouldn't have been even able to probably have a relationship with Father Roy that I met originally that asked me to participate in, in the model Seder. All these developments and his quote, his famous quote that he said that he used to tell his, uh, his congregation that in order to be a good Christian, you have to be a good Jew first. So for me, that was an opportunity to, uh, to share what I've been studying for many years, still not thinking to become a rabbi, and I really became a rabbi through this conversation. So if I would trace back um, the, even my own personal history, I could trace it it to uh, somehow the change that happened in the world um, around Second Vatican Council. We'll talk more about that, of course, in the, uh, the series. Today is just an introduction to, uh, to what it means to convene a council in general and, and the need to, to convene such a, uh, a big uh, meeting. So I've been reading this book uh, from John Malloy, uh, O'Malley, and it really is an incredible um, survey of what this whole four years um, meant for the for the church and for the uh, for its surrounding. And, and I'll use a lot of these quotes. So, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Don Russo. Don and I, of course, have been friends and uh, working together with, in Project Genesis uh, for about uh, at least, what, I would say 10 years since I've been here, and more than that, about 12 years. So um, Don, uh, really through Don, I learned a lot about the Christian uh, faith and, uh, and, of course, the friendship that we've had. So Don, it will be... A conversation between us, and I'm going to ask you questions and try to make a few comments in Good. between. Good. Okay, Don. Right. Just keep keep the questions simple. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, this is, I know, for those of you who are here and those of you who are on Zoom, this is going to be an educational process for, for most people. Uh, so there are a lot of terms and concepts which may be new. 
But one of the things that we've got to keep in mind is that um, this council that we're going to talk about opened the door for the Catholic Church to Judaism. Um, the history, uh, Christians versus Jews for, for centuries and centuries, brought a lot of suffering and grief uh, and vitriol over the centuries. And, and Vatican II took a step in bringing about dialogue and friendship. And that's why we've subtitled this, this series, uh, Interfaith Friendships. Uh, I myself have been involved in ecumenical and interfaith education since 1969. Even though I taught in Catholic schools, um, <clears throat> my, my non-teaching activities centered around belonging to interfaith ecumenical uh, organizations. So I'm very comfortable with uh, this whole topic. Um, so let me, let me begin anyway uh, with some basic uh, terms that at least will familiarize you, you uh, and ourselves with what is going on. We're, we're talking about an ecumenical or a general council of the Catholic Church. And an ecumenical council <clears throat> is a formal gathering of all the bishops of the world. Uh, and the names of the council, the, the councils are named for the cities in which they occur. And in the history, in the 21 centuries of, of the church, uh, there have been 21 ecumenical councils, the latest of which was begun as of next year, 60 years ago, in 19, 1962. And it lasted for four years, but not complete four years. It were, were, there were four sessions, one session each during the year, and usually lasted from October to December. <clears throat> uh, the word ecumenical is, comes from a Greek word, oikumene, uh, which is a word that appears in the New Testament uh, and refers to the whole inhabited world. And yet the root of the word oikumene uh, means household. So we're talking about, when we're talking about uh, ecumenical matters or ecumenism, we're talking about, in this sense, Christian, the Christian household. All right? It's worldwide. Um, so this ecumenical movement in the 20th century uh, was meant to bring about uh, the, the unity, the reunification uh, of the Christian churches. It began uh, well before Vatican II, but Vatican II kind of put the focus on reunion and, and reuniting. Um, so let me ask you, so what was the impetus of, uh, of convening this particular council and, and what was the need for unity at that point? Is that the connection? Well, I, I historical think... Historical connection after the, the Holocaust? Well, the Second yeah, World I War? think that um, the, the meeting of the church itself grew out of the election of Pope John XXIII. Um, and Pope John XXIII, if you don't realize it, was elected pope. He was at advanced age. And they thought after the long papacy of Pius XII that John XXIII would be a caretaker pope. He wouldn't last too long, wouldn't make a great impact. All right? He was in his 70s and so on. Well, the next thing you know, three months after he's elected, he announces that there's going to be this ecumenical council, which shook people to, the, to, their, to their bones. Right. Yeah, just to give a, a, an idea of how many people came. So the, it was 2,200 bishops, but 
overall with the other advisors and councils, and um, it came to about 4,000 people in Rome for those four years. And all of the major sessions took place, believe it or not, in the center aisle of St. Peter's. So if you know what the size of St. Peter's Basilica is, uh, there were banks of seats um, placed on each side of the aisle, which held all of the bishops and, uh, and the observers. You still had about, I don't know, 10 or 12 feet to walk down the aisle, so you can imagine. Um, there were, I, I think, 2,600 bishops over the course. It wasn't the same number each time, but over the course of four years, there were 2,600 bishops that attended out of the possible 2,900 in the world. Some could make it because of health, some were behind the Iron Curtain at the time, and so on and so forth. Um, but this, this um, according to John the 23rd, and these are his words with regard to this council, <clears throat> excuse me, by virtue of the number and variety of those who will participate in its meetings, it will be the greatest of the councils held by the church so far. And what he meant by greatest here, specifically uh, and initially, uh, dealt with the number of bishops, uh, the places in the world that were represented, and the number of observers. So, for example, the last ecumenical council that the church had was Vatican Council I, which took place in 1869-1870. And um, at that time, there were 737 bishops who attended. Right? Vatican II, you had over 2,500 bishops attending. And there was also a war during Second Vatican, the First, Vatican, first Vatican Council. First Vatican Council. Yeah, so, so that interrupted that too. It interrupted it, and as, as wars in Europe interrupted many of the councils beforehand. Um, but it just, what John meant was, if you look at the numbers, there were 737 bishops at, at Vatican I. If you look at the representation of the Catholic Church throughout the world, let me throw out some numbers to you here. Obviously, the most, bishop, most of the bishops came from Europe, and there were about a little under 1,100 bishops from Europe. But South America had 400. North America had 375. Asia had 296. Africa had 64. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Asia had 374. Uh, Africa had 296, Central America 64, and Oceania had 75. So the representation of the church was worldwide. It was truly an ecumenical council. Um, uh, so this is these councils, and this specific council really changed the whole conversation about um, how much to engage in the world. This is a conversation that religions have in, in, in their core. You know, how much to engage with the outside world and what pace and so forth. We all have to engage, but sometimes we, we take our time too much and then we need to have like a full renovation. So what the, what the church really did in this council, it did a full renovation of the house. Like you said, ecu ecumenical uh, means your home. So the house, so the house of God. So it needed a full renovation. And, and that really is the significance of that. The, the historical context of it af being after Second World War and, and after the Holocaust, of course, um, is significant too because it almost like the church repented um, on, uh, uh, about its own history and anti-Semitic history um, that somehow stemmed from the teachings of uh, or did certain interpretations of the teachings of the New Testament. Uh, 
and, and the, in a certain sense, that's very, very, the whole idea of this particular council was to open, John XXIII had a wonderful word. He called it aggiornamento. Aggiornamento was meant to update the church, all right, to open the windows, let the fresh air in. That's how it was described. All right. um, up to Vatican II, practically all of the church councils came together to either define doctrines uh, or to confront serious attacks on the church, both regards to doctrine, to liturgy, to whatever. Um, <clears throat> yeah. even, even the state of Israel, you know, this is the first council that has been convened after the Jewish people, diaspora, returned to its land. So since the, the inception of, of the church, even if we trace it to the first century, that was at the destruction of the second temple, the second commonwealth of the Jewish people. And here we are at what we consider the third commonwealth, or the kind of the third attempt to create uh, a Jewish homeland. And this is the challenge, not just on the political side, it's also theological, because uh, if the church somehow promoted before that the successionism, now what do we do? The Jewish people are still here, you know, and they just built a, a, a political state, too. So, so it means that there's somehow the sovereignty over the land returned. So we're talking about in the 60s. It was before the unification of Jerusalem, but it was after already uh, being an established state. So all these are very interesting from my perspective because I can trace every step in, in the Jewish uh, history and, the, and, of course, the modern uh, Zionism and to see it in, in connection with what the church did and you, you don't sometimes as a when, when we're young we don't realize that we live in a much bigger context that affected where we were born, where we went to school all these components of our lives that we had no control over but other big somehow circles around us decided that for us the Second Vatican Council, I realized how much it affected my circles going, looking back at my, at my almost five decades of my life. Yeah, it, it, I, if I can share with you some of my own personal experiences, uh, I grew up in a traditional, devout Roman Catholic family. Um, no crises religious wise. Uh, my, my, uh, the four of us, the, the four children, and my mother and father, we were what you would call devout Catholics. We went to Mass every Sunday in the Holy Days. Uh, we performed uh, piety, our piety, grew out of our prayer life and, and uh, liturgical celebrations. Um, and in, in those days, in the 60s, um, Coming from a place like, I, I was born in Brooklyn, okay, and I can always remember that you were identified in Brooklyn uh, not by the neighborhood that you lived in, but by the parish that you belonged mm. to, the church that you belonged to. That, that was the center of Catholic culture. Now, you also have to remember, too, mm. that up until that point, the church had always been vis-a-vis -vis Protestantism and Eastern Orthodoxy um, in a defensive stance, all right? We, we, we grew out of that Reformation which attacked the church. Um, so the stance that we took as Catholics against Protestants and, and uh, Orthodox would be kind of like Cassius Clay or Muhammad Ali and his rope-a-dope stance. You know, he'd be standing there with his hands in front of his face, his arms in front of him. So if you hit him, he won't get hurt. So the church lived in that, that culture, 
And it was a nurturing culture. Um, and it was one that was very, very supportive. And yet, growing up in that culture, anything the church did was fine. All right? You never questioned the church and so on and so forth. Well, as time went on, I started my studies for the priesthood, and make a long story short, I was, um, when I started the seminary in, in, in Huntington, I started as a philosopher, studying philosophy, but the fellows ahead of me um, were all studying theology. And Vatican II began in 1962, was the year I, I, uh, I started in, um, in, in the seminary. Um, and I can remember the excitement, not knowing really what was happening. I knew something was happening in the church. But I remember the excitement of the fellow studying theology, uh, of, of the new things coming out, especially in the liturgy, uh, in, in worship, and so on and so forth. And the, the one thing I always remembered was we had a bookstore in the seminary. And I can remember every day going down to the bookstore and seeing publication after publication being delivered from Europe. Hmm. All right? In other words, the books and the documents that were being published at that time were coming out of Europe. Uh, there was a bookstore in, in uh, Oxford, England, Blackwell's, and they did more business from... Uh, Huntington, New York, in the seminary than I think they did anywhere else in the world. I'm exaggerating, of course. But we, the, the fellows would be ordering books left and right that were being published in English, and, and we were able to get, it was kind of like the, the Amazon of the day. You could get just about any book in theology or that you wanted. So two years later, um, when I was about to begin my theological studies, I was assigned uh, to go to Rome to do my theological studies there. Truthfully, I get on the boat with 50 other fellows from the United States. We were all going to Rome. We knew something was going on. We weren't too clear as to what the impact would be. Council had already been in session for two years. So when we got there, we ended up in a situation, in a city that was permeated with talk of and the works of and the excitement of this council. And I use the word excitement because I think many people today, um, especially when it comes to religious matters, especially church matters, don't experience an occasion, as I did, in Rome, where the existence of the Spirit of God was almost tangible. The enthusiasm, the, the uh, positivity, the hope, I would say optimism, but I don't like the word optimism, I'd rather use the word hope, that the church would finally be reforming itself and catching up to uh, the modern world. It was my introduction to universality, the universality of the church, because in the university that I went to, there were students from all over the world. And it just opened my eyes that I'm, I'm hearing different languages. Uh, I'm, I'm talking to, to fellows who, thank God, at that point spoke English so I could understand them. I was just learning Italian. Um, and, and listening to their experiences. Uh, to me, that feeling, regardless of, of what is going on today in religion and, and criticisms, and th that feeling of, of being and working with the Holy Spirit will never leave me. It, it, it has made a lifelong impact on me. And that was the spirit that permeated this meeting that grew out of the, the, the direction of this so-called caretaker pope. And it just 
blew the, the, the theological world upside down. So I come at the understanding of Vatican II with an experience. Okay. This is above and beyond re reading the documents, mm -hmm. above and beyond studying. Um, and I can remember one of the first things that I learned when I was in Rome that came out of the council was the, the saying that the church always must be reformed. Re Reformation within the church had to be an ongoing process, mm -hmm. all right? which a lot of people don't like because it demands change. And for many people, religion was the security blanket that they grew up with. I know it was with me. <clears throat> but it's the security blanket that travels throughout the generation. It's not stuck, and that's actually why it's a, it's a security blanket. It's because it's, it's, it's uh, able to transform itself through time and space. So I, when people ask me as a Jew, you know, what uh, denomination are you? So I say I'm a conservatively reformed orthodox. And what it means is that you have to have orthodoxy in every faith and everything you do in life, your core values that shouldn't be changing. But you're always going to reform. We don't look like Moses, and we don't even act and behave like the Judaism in the temple. You know, we were, the, the Judaism that we practice today grew, grew together, or was even born. I would say together with the uh, with the with Christianity, so we have that common. You know, I, we don't share the same faith, but we share a lot of components of the faith. And this is another thing for me that what's the challenge to when you reform to reform conservatively. So that's why I say you know I'm a conservatively reformed orthodox, because I know that we always have to reform, but when you reform, you have to do it conservatively so you can serve the orthodox value um, you have. So for me, that was the challenge to think if, if Judaism would have to now convene a council like this, how would that look like? About two years ago, I, well, more than that now, two years, three years ago, um, I was uh, invited to, to attend the Palm Sunday uh, service, a mass in, uh, in Vatican Square, and I was sitting, you know, with, on, with the, uh, where the Pope was and the archbishops, and, and I was looking at the million of people who was, were in the, the, uh, um, that square, and I was thinking, this is how, this is the closest that it probably felt and looked like in the days that Judaism had the temple. And people came on the pilgrimages to Jerusalem. So there would be that big building, right? It would be the high priest who would do the, the service, and there would be a, a million spectators, or people who would come at pilgrim. pilgrim. So when it came to Second Vatican Council and, and I, understanding this, especially that we live in the time for, for the Jewish people um, post, you know, we are now, uh, well, there's still diaspora, but there's a, a Jewish homeland. So this was a huge change. It was as important as the change that the Jewish people experienced 2,000 years ago with the destruction of the temple. And that was radical change, of course, and had to, to force us to rethink our, our faith. So here, there's another big change, that the, the reestablishment of the state of Israel, the Jewish homeland. Now, what do we do? I'll give you an example. There was one um, um, when the, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, uh, decided to rewrite the prayer book in, in the sense that to make it one version for all the soldiers, because soldiers came from all kinds of backgrounds. 
from the east, from the west. They had different traditions in the prayer. Pretty much the same, but different customs and, uh, around it. So it had to think of how it brings all the diaspora Jews that came to Israel now in, under one liturgical um, uh, uh, you know, version. So here, this is the challenge. How do you mobilize people physically, of course, coming to, to one place, and in this case was Rome, but how do you mobilize their mind, which is, of course, more challenging it's always the, the human component that takes the time to, to implement. So this was, it, it's so fascinating, all the layers of coming together and the holy, that Holy Spirit that you're talking about. This is what I'm attracted to that too. That spirit, there was a, the, clearly there was a spark there in time and place that God spoke and said, I'm bringing the people the religious people from all over the world to figure out, you know, how do we step into the future? So that on that level, it's, it's very similar too. And, and especially when, when you're talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're talking about reform, one thing that, that we always have to remember in the midst of any reform is to be true to the tradition. All right? We must preserve the tradition. But part of the reform is to decide and, and rethink and rediscover what the actual tradition is. Because in many cases, all right, tradition can be clouded by custom, and they're both, they're not necessarily the same thing. And so many people hold on to the customs, and if you change the customs, which obviously vary historically, geographically, and so on, they think that you're somehow changing the tradition. And you're really not. Right? Um, there's a, there's a, a man named Gustav Mahler who, who had a wonderful definition of uh, tradition. And I think it hits, it, it hits the point. He said, tradition is not the worship of ashes, but the preservation of the fire. Mm -hmm. Choose life, just like Moses tells us at the end. Choose life. Don't, right. don't attach yourself to the dead. And in the New Testament, when uh, uh, was Jesus saying, let the dead bury the dead? No, that's right. Yeah, so yeah. it's let... Let the dead be dead, and we also say in, in Psalm, it's not those who die, the, the, the dead, who praise God. Right. The living. Yeah, so again, let me, I, one of the things I found fascinating in going back over these documents and is how familiar, and I, I know for some people out there, this is not going to sound that uh, enticing, but I was just reading some of the things that John the 23rd spoke when the council started. And it reminds me of how much he is like our present Pope, Pope Francis. Um, John the 23rd was this roly poly northern Italian whom everybody loved. All right? But they thought he was just a roly poly Italian who was going to hang on and, and be an interim. Uh, until he just shocked the world. But he was a healer. He wanted to reach out in relationship to heal. So let, me, let me read you a couple of things that he said, uh, which puts me in mind of the attitude of even today. Um, he said, divine providence is leading us to a new order of human relations. He had a passion of bringing people together. He was open to and allowed dialogue and was okay with that. So again, you take the historical context. Dialogue was not looked upon very favorably by Catholics. All right? uh, there was always the fear that if you start dialoguing with other people, you would fall into relativism. All right? um, 
His openness to change was rooted in his deep faith. That, to me, is an extremely important concept. The deeper your faith, the more comfortable you are with change. It, it seems like a paradox. But in order to change for the better, you've got to have a deep faith. I mean, if you're going to change, if I'm going to change myself on a human level, deep down, I have to have faith that there's something better to move towards. Um, and people of deep, deep faith do not fear change. Uh, as, a, as a priest once said to me, remember this, in the midst of everything, the crisis you may be going through in religion, fear does not come from God. Fear is not from God. And every once in a while, you have to step back and say, whoa, you know, what, what is this fear that I'm feeling? But remember that we have a merciful God. He's not a God that induces fear as a means to get people to do things. Right? It's just not the God we, we believe so in. What was, the, what was the biggest challenge for Pope John XXIII in convening this council? I think the, the newness of, of bringing together a whole church in a context... Um, in, the, in the world context of the 60s, now most of us in here remember the 60s, all right, what, how turbulent it was. Um, and one of the things that most people don't realize, they think that movements like this start from the top or come from the top, and yet my experience was that the seeds for this council began many decades earlier the grassroots were beginning to develop. There were questions being raised. And I think when John became Pope, he was sensitive to that, to the movements of the church, which pointed to the need to update. And I think that right. was the biggest challenge. And, and, and I would say, you know, just to put a disclaimer out there, that there are many, of course, Catholics that were not happy with some of the changes or... Um, you know, the, maybe even the, the change itself, you know, the, and we'll, we'll talk about the specifics in the series, um, like changing, for example, the Latin Mass. Right. So some people really liked it, and it's not just the Latin in terms of the language, it's really the, the structure and the uh, more of high church uh, yeah, service. So... Yeah. The, the, one, the one thing I, we loved about John was his sense of humor. Um, a real gift. Right? If, if, if a leader doesn't have a sense of humor, you be careful. All right? Because all of a sudden, every, he's going to take every, he or she is going to take everything so seriously. All right? But John was one, he had a sense of, of a humor which showed his ability to deal with the ambiguities of life. And I know that as part of my life now, later on, I have really come to believe that we don't live in an either-or world. That we live in a world filled with ambiguities, and if we're going to survive, we have to learn how to live with those ambiguities. And John was very, very much aware of that. Um, he said, basically, uh, it was so Christ-like to place human persons above ideology. And as soon as I read that again, I thought of what was going on in the world today. And, and one of Pope Francis's favorite statements is, reality is more important than ideas. Because human beings are more important than ideas. And human beings live and act in reality. Right? They're not some imaginative group. Right? And so I really believe that John, and by temperament, by religious temperament, they were alike. Right. Um, 
Right, this is an interesting point because it's, sometimes it's just the temperament that needs to change for openness. You may not change any of, you know, of course, your uh, decrees or the creeds or dogmas, but, the, but somehow just the, the spirit, the different spirit right. of a conversation. So also we have to understand that the context of uh, uh, of information, the transmission of information. We live now, 100 years, the council before that was 100 years earlier, in the mid-1800s. Imagine the, the, the change in technology and transmission of, of information. Sure. And how to bring, even in change. the council itself, how to bring a common language to 2,500 bishops who spoke different languages, right? And you're having a speaker speak in his um, uh, native language, which most of the bishops wouldn't understand, and you've got the simultaneous translations going on. So the, the whole idea of technology, even in the 60s, was so important for this council to, to move on. Um, and you had asked me about John and his concerns. Uh, I'll kind of finish with this in terms of John. He said... As I go about my daily work as Pope, I sometimes have to listen with much regret to voices of persons not endowed with too much sense of discretion or measure. He says, I feel I must disagree with these prophets of gloom who are always forecasting disaster as though the end of the world was at hand. I right. think we can learn about this today, too. Absolutely. All right. uh, again, you look at the world around us, and regardless of what it is, whether it's politics, religion, anything else, look at how fear is playing into being a primary motivation mm -hmm. for people to react and act. All right. And as we said, even on a religious level, Fear doesn't come from God. All right. uh, the world, how many times has the world been predicted to end? You know, repent, the world is, the end is coming. And, you know, we think we're gods. We know when. And it passes by. Right. We have to keep moving forward, living with the ambiguities, living with human beings, and knowing how to communicate. And communication was one of John's strong points, right. we have to keep moving ahead. There's going to be disagreements, but the only way you're going to deal with disagreements is by communicating with one another, not by screaming and shouting. So you can maybe actually say that this whole Second Vatican Council was an exercise in communication. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. How to communicate within the church and how to communicate with outside. And one of the things that we're going to mention, which is very, very important, is that for the first time in 2100 years, the language that was used in writing the documents of the council was totally different from the language of all previous 20, 20 councils. The language itself, which has to be taken into consideration as part of the context of interpreting Vatican II. Look at the language it uses to bring forth its ideas. And the language it uses is very pastoral. All right? The word pastoral is rooted in the idea of shepherding. The, the pastor, in, in Latin, the word pastor means shepherd. So when you speak pastorally, all right, you're speaking as a shepherd not as an autocrat, not as an authoritarian. So the language of Vatican II was also extremely very, very important, and that's one of the contexts. You know, there's a, there's a saying which I think is extremely pertinent when you come to interpret any of these doctrines, and it's also true of interpretation of Scripture. A text without a context becomes a pretext for anything you want it to mean. 
In order to validly interpret something, you need a context. Right? Or else, as some people do, they'll go through the Bible or they'll go through the Constitution of the United States, pick out a phrase out of context, and throw it up there as proof. The Bible says this. Or the Constitution says this. Right? Everything is it's got to be done within the context of not only when it was written, how it was written, but what is the context that it's being used in today. Um, and we'll talk about that especially as we, as we go on and talk yeah. about... So, so you, me you mentioned that you learned about universalism when, or universality when you, when you lived in Rome, when you moved from your sheltered cocoon into uh, this, the ocean of people. And I think this is, this is exactly the exercise that was going on here, too, is kind of breaking out through the, the cocoon right. and, and facing you know, the world. Do you want to actually um, talk about the difference uh, of the, in the documents that were in the three levels and the categories? Um, the council over four years produced as an end product 16 documents. Um, that's, that's just the end product. The whole process of these documents, some of these documents took over four years to even come to where they were. A lot of people don't realize, too, that a lot of the documents contain um, compromises that people were not aware, aware of in the final document because of the, of the discussions that were going on. And it's very interesting. When I was in Rome, um, the, um, the, the terminology of concern, like, it's not like it is today. The, we weren't using the terminology of liberal and conservative. The terminology that you would hear coming out of the council was majority-minority. Right? So you didn't know how to designate liberal, conservative, and what was going on. You had a majority, you had a minority. And the votes for these documents were overwhelming. Uh, overwhelmingly more than, much more than two-thirds of the vote. But to put it into context, there were 16 documents. Four were most important. They were known as constitutions. Right? Now, constitution is a document that declares a teaching that is of substantial nature and one that is central to the entire church. So just to mention... There was a constitution on the church, a constitution on divine revelation, on sacred liturgy, and church in the modern world. They were, it's like the constitution of the United States. That, that was your, these were central to an understanding, a modern, up-to-date understanding of how the church, the church in relationship to the world, its worship, and its understanding of God's revelation, what it meant to the church. They were central. There were nine decrees, uh, documents that were considered decrees. There were nine of them. And the decrees gave a significant teaching, but one that required further discussion. <coughs> Obviously, all of these documents needed to be further discussed. You couldn't deal with everything, it's, it's, it, it, the implications and the meaning in the four years that it was there. It's too new. Um, and, um, and then there were three declarations. And what eventually is going to affect our discussion would be one of the decrees and one of the declarations. Mm -hmm. Now, a declaration is an address... Uh, is one that, uh, a document that addresses the areas that may be, by its nature, controversial and in need of further doctrinal development. The, the key document that is relating to what our whole discussion is about 
is, is the one on the relationship of the church to non-Christian religions. One of the shortest, but one of the most impactful. Um, yeah, and it's very interesting that the Second Vatican Council is famous for the Nostra Aetate, and actually was a declaration in those three levels, a higher, in the hierarchy of the importance of those documents, the constitutions are the most important, then decrees, and then the declarations. And this was in the declaration. And it didn't even necessarily uh, specifically, what originally it, it meant to be for the Jews, then it expanded itself right. to uh, treat other religions. The, um, in fact, let me, the document that w affects us the most is, is not just a document on ecumenism, uh, which was a separate document. Uh, it was one of the decrees, but the, the declaration about non-Christian religions, um, the Latin name for it is Nostra Etate. Now, documents in the church, always their titles always come from the first two words, the first two Latin words of the document itself. So Nostra Etate means in our time, uh, in, in this time. So that's how it's, all documents in the church are recognized by the first two words of the title. But this, I, I have, I, I just want to read to you how this document, how this, the first paragraph of this document, because this was earth shattering. Uh, in fact, it's, this document was one of the last ones promulgated. It was it, in October of 1965. The council ended in December of 1965. So this is just the first paragraph of, of this, dec of, of this uh, declaration. In our time, there's your title, when day by day humankind is being drawn closer together. So there's the, the understanding that people are, because of news media, because of technology, the world is growing closer together. And the ties between different peoples are becoming stronger. The church examines more closely her relationship to non-Christian religion. In her task of promoting unity and love among human beings, indeed among nations, she considers above all in this declaration what people have in common and what draws them to fellowship. Now, in today's world, we don't see that as earth shattering. But 60 years ago, yes. very, very, very much so. And um, what the document ultimately does, the document, before it took on its final, its final uh, uh, form, was meant to be solely a document concerning the church and the Jews. And then all of a sudden, the perspective opened. One of the reasons, interestingly enough, why it broadened, it was trying to understand, the church was trying to understand the Jews, but the context was, first of all, the context, context of the years 1939, especially to 1945. The Jewish, the, the, the things that the Jews were, in, were, were being persecuted in those years. And then, above all, the Holocaust itself. But also in the 60s, to show you how things begin to change, you had the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So if you're going to talk about non-Christian religions, besides talking about Judaism, there was another world religion that was on the scene now, Islam. How do we begin to talk about and understand Islam? And once you begin, if you, if you include then Islam in this discussion, you've got the two other major world religions, which are Hinduism and Buddhism. So this short document all of a sudden opened the church's doors and windows to having to be open to 
not only the Jews and all of the anti-Semitism, and that was the reason why the document was, was geared towards talking about the Jews because all of a sudden it became quite clear of the anti-Semitism that was in existence. But not only at that time, but if you look back over the history of the church, the anti-Semitism which grew up as the church was growing. So, so what? all of a sudden, we Catholics, all right, or at least those of us who were, were aware of it, had our eyes opened and say, man, we better start understanding and bringing ourselves to the modern world. And, and when Gotti had said to me, you know, mentioned to, that my experience in Rome of universality was one of the most important experiences I had because that was the thing that opened me up from the, the Catholic ghetto that I grew up in, mm -hmm. all right, or the Catholic culture that I grew up in, to understanding what it meant that the church was universal. The word Catholic itself means universal, small c. And all of a sudden, my eyes were open that if I was going to deal and do theology, I had to do it in the context of universality and in the context of understanding God after the Holocaust. Because we, at least in theology circles, the impact of the Holocaust on the theological world, right. not only shook up the Jews, but it re refashioned the question, what kind of God, the God we deal with in theology, what kind of God would allow the Holocaust to happen? Right. And, so, I would, and I would add, what kind of man would allow a Holocaust to happen? And I think it treated both. It tried to deal with both, the relationship that we had with God and how did, did we permit something like this to happen, but also how did we permit each other to, to act like this. And so, again, this was, as much as Gotti and I are comfortable, very comfortable in doing this, this is kind of going back to the roots of where the openness began. And, and to understand this, this council and these documents uh, as foundational. Many people today don't understand, they don't understand what Vatican II was all about. They thought it was unnecessary, disruptive, and so on and so forth, uh, because they don't understand the context. Uh, they see it as threatening. Um, and, and my experience with Gotti, it's very interesting that in the years that we have worked together on this Jewish Christian inquiry, we know where we differ. We know how we differ. Right? We joke about it sometimes, we get serious about it sometimes. But as we're discussing the elements, it always seems that our discussion ends up a level deeper than the superficial than just the documents, the disagreement among documents. All right. you know, I firmly believe it, it's, it's, it's not my belief in doctrine that's going to save me. Right. It's my belief in God, my belief in, in Christ that is ultimately going to be the nucleus of why and how and the grace of God that I will be saved not what I believe. Now obviously if you belong to an institutional religion, each institution has its own doctrine and, and reasons for membership, which we all have to take into consideration. Yeah, so it's not just what you believe, it's how you believe. That's right. And how you practice your faith. So, um, you know, Maybe we'll end this part and we'll have a little bit of maybe of a question. Uh, question. Um, so for me, kind of to 
to wrap the thoughts about just the introduction today is that the way O'Malley also describes it as the biggest meeting of ever, probably. He's talking about our century, but to bring all these thousands of people to work together. It's not the biggest meet or the biggest gathering, of course. People have gathered in millions, but it's the, the biggest working meeting. So that is really incredible. Today, you can only achieve that through Zoom, probably, to bring all these people together. So um, this was, of course, we'll talk about more of the different elements as we go. And I, part of our intention is also to, if possible, to bring ministers from different right. denominations uh, and ask them and talk to them about what impact Vatican II had on their denominations, their Christian denominations, mm -hmm. Orthodox denominations, Jewish denominations, uh, as, we, as we move along in terms of this discussion. Yeah. So, so we'll go over the documents that were presented and uh, summarize them and you know, bring our conversation into it. Okay. So thank you very much for coming. And uh, if you have some questions, yes. we'll take you. Yeah. No. Bishops in the Catholic Church, there are major um, levels of ordained ministers. The lowest level is deacon. Then you have priest, and then you have bishop. So the highest level of ordained minister in the Catholic Church is the bishop. A cardinal, up until recently, did not have to be a bishop, did not have to be a priest. The cardinal was an honorary title or an honorary position that the Pope granted to an individual, and one of the um, perquisites of being a cardinal was that you were able to vote for the Pope. It's only the cardinals who could vote for the Pope. All right? So, Oh, yes. Oh, definitely. That's right. In other words, every cardinal that, that participated in Vatican II was a bishop. Is there, is there a, a printed uh, uh, list uh, of the Constitution of the Vatican II that was signed by the Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I mean, there are... Yeah. So, there are, so Don has a, a vast library of, of, about Second Vatican Council, and no, no, no but no. by a John O'Malley was a he attended as a uh, a priest. Um, not so much, no, because because what we have now, uh, what they had, and you can tell this book is pretty worn. But this is a, a, um, a book that was printed back in the 60s with all of the documents. It's, it's entitled The Documents of Vatican II. So there, are, there, is a book there are a couple of books with translations. Um, now, if, you're, uh, if you, you're a student at the computer, all right, you can actually go on the Vatican... Um, well, you can actually... Um, Google, you know, let's say the, uh, the, uh, the Vatican II's Constitution on the Church. And one of the, the things that will come up will probably be a translation of the document. One went right to Kindle and said, uh, give me a book on the Constitution of the Catholic Church. Did Kindle have a book? Oh, okay. Uh, I, you know, that's a good question. Um, I don't know how many of those, uh, of those, because most of the books that you'll get on Kindle would be some form of um, interpretation and discussion or history. You, there really is no official book except yeah. the, the most official document 
would come from the Vatican, which you can get on their website. Yeah, but the, but the, I, when I was searching for a book to, to start with, I had the same issue that you are raising now. There wasn't an, an official book that explains it. The Vatican, of course, releases the, the uh, documents, but they, they don't necessarily comment on the discussion that came about. And it's really about um, not just the documents themselves, it's about the conversations that have happened um, during that time. I'll give you an example. We, uh, I'm going to start teaching a series at the synagogue called Beyond Dispute. It's a, it's a series that the Jewish Theological Seminary, my seminary uh, produced. And what it does is it looks at um, important conversations that happened in the Talmud uh, over the centuries about exactly that, reforming or uh, treating a certain issue. So that, that changed Judaism as we know it. So what changed is not just the, the bottom line of the conversation, which is the, the, the documents that the Vatican uh, um, published, but it really is about the conversation that happened during. And actually, O'Malley mentions in the book that um, what we see as the final version of those uh, documents, of these conversations, they don't even begin to reflect what really happened in those rooms and the discussions. So that's really what is, there's no official conversation like that, right? That the Vatican produced, let's say, uh, it's the, the, own, the conversations themselves, right? This came from people who attended it. Yeah, the, the, uh, the conversations the about these documents basically went on during the council. I mean, I have commentaries at home about that thick, six volumes of the discussions that went on for each document which produced the document. Right. But I just went on, I just went on Amazon, um, and there's a whole list. I typed in documents of Vatican II, um, and there are definitely um, books with the documents uh, published. Um, there haven't been any decent translations. Thank you.